So for beginning herbalists, Malin is a great herb to learn about because it's gentle, it's very effective and virtuous and pretty easy to identify. Hello and welcome to the Herbs with Rosalie podcast, a show exploring how herbs heal as medicine, as food, and through nature connection. I'm your host, Rosalie de la Forêt. I created this YouTube channel to share trusted herbal wisdom so that you can get the best results when relying on herbs for your health. I love offering up practical knowledge to help you dive deeper into the world of medicinal plants and seasonal living. Each episode of the Herbs with Rosalie podcast is shared on YouTube as well as your favorite podcast app. Transcripts and recipes for each episode can be found at herbswithrosaliepodcast.com or through the link in the video description. Also in the video description, you'll find other helpful resources. For example, to get my best herbal tips, as well as fun bonuses, be sure to sign up for my weekly herbal newsletter. Okay, grab your cup of tea and let's dive in. When Jim told me he wanted to do a really long episode on Mullen, I admittedly still wasn't prepared for how long he really wanted to go. But he told me that he never feels like he gets to truly share all that he wants to share about Mullen, and who am I to deny him that opportunity? So grab your cup of tea, get cozy, and bring your notepad and pencil, because there's a lot packed into this episode. Beginning with, is there such a thing as a beginner herb? For those of you who don't already know Jim McDonald, he's my good friend, as well as an herbalist in Southeast Michigan, which is that cool state that looks like a mitten you can see from space, where he teaches, sees clients, wild harvests, and concocts a plethora of diverse herbal formulas. His approach to herbalism blends European folk influences mixed up with a bit of the 19th century eclectic and physiomedical vitalism, which he tries to spice up with a bit of humor and discretionary irreverence so as not to appear to be too serious about life. Jim hosts the websites herbcraft.org and herbcraft.podia.com, which lists his offering and conveys his thoughts of plants and herbalism. By the way, Jim spells his name in all lower cases. He is very particular about this. And if you've ever wondered about the lack of capitalization, it's this. It's simply because the dots over the J and the I just look super cool together. Hey, Jim. Hi, Rosalie. How are you? Oh, well, I'm very good. I'm very excited to be here with you. Um, I was just reflecting how this came to be because you are here for the third time. And Very cool. third time on the podcast, you're also a frequent guest on um, as a guest instructor for my various courses. Um, that's because you are not only my teacher, but you're also my friend. And I often get a kick out of hanging out with you. But this time was funny because you just messaged me out of the blue, like all your mess- out of all your messages are. And you said, hey, we should do a really long Mullen podcast. And I was like, that's cool. Jim is mulling over mullen. See that? I did a thing that you I, do. Yeah. I might and, have really, like, really long. But it might have been capitalized. Yeah. Well, that was funny because I was like, sure, Jim, you can. My show is your show. You can do whatever you want on my show. Although I actually, you were one person I would not want to say that to. But, you know, <laughs> it's now recorded. let's keep it G rated. Let's, let's put some boundaries on that, Jim. At 10.36, Herbs with Rosalie is now Herbs with Rosalie under, like, the auspices of, of Jim, right? Yeah, yeah, that could go really well or badly. We would have to find out. But anyway, I was like, sure, Jim, you can do Mullen. And then you reiterated after that. But can it be really long so that really? we can really cover everything Mullen? And I'm like, sure, Jim, but, you know isn't mullen just a simple weed? Isn't it just like a beginner's herb? Aren't there like sexier yeah. herbs you could talk about? I mean, mullen? Well, what what could be sexier than mullen though? Um, no, that idea, the idea of like beginner's herbs, like I understand where it comes from because the, the reason people will talk about mullen and use the phrase like it's a beginner's herb, what they really mean is it's a fairly easy herb to identify, right? You know, so it's pretty recognizable. Most people can figure it out, although I would like to get into some significant considerations with identification. Um, and it's really safe and gentle, 
And so, I mean, it's kind of hard to do harm with mullein. So for beginning herbalists, mullein is a great herb to learn about because it's gentle, it's very effective and virtuous um, and pretty easy to identify. But I mean, I've never thought about like an animal being a beginner's animal. And I've never thought about like a person being like a beginner's person, you know? So I wouldn't be <laughs> yeah, like, you know. Graduate to the next person. <laughs> like, so you're just starting out being alive and um, maybe you should start knowing beginner's people. Um, and then after you get gain some life experience, you could move on to like intermediate people. And then maybe if you really study hard at life and being alive and having relationships, you can, you can learn about advanced people. <laughs> and I think that because a way that a lot of people learn um, through like conventional educational systems, uh, which may vary where you're at if you're listening to this, but here in North America, we might take this idea of like beginner and intermediate and advanced and be like less effective and more effective, or these things are stronger or the advanced things work better. Um, and then that this is not like a great way to think, you know, because what, what could be more virtuous than, than melon? Hmm. No. There's, I there's other, I'm about to find out. So yeah, there's other very virtuous things, but, um, like I think with melon, it is a plant that I just keep learning about all the time. You know, I learn something new. I think of something myself. Someone else tells me something about melon and yet probably the most common things that you'll find about it, like the, the, the basics, you know, that, that everyone says and everyone agrees on is like, if you have a cough, you can, you know, take mullein in some form or another. And if you have an earache or an ear infection, you can make some mullein flower oil, maybe mix it with garlic and use that. And those things are both true, but there's a lot more nuance. There's a lot more things to discover about it. And maybe like a great place to start is, although because mullein is kind of like a silvery green gray color, you know, and, and very fuzzy. And when the stalk grows up, it can be, you know, it can be like five feet tall or six feet tall or eight feet tall or 10 feet tall, depending on the growing conditions and maybe the species. It can have branch out, have multiple flower stalks. And so it's an easy thing. People are like, oh, especially I saw it on the side of the expressway or I saw it in an old field or it popped up in my yard. And what is that thing? Because it really stands out. It's hard not to notice when it's taller than you are. Um, I still feel like that what I frequently hear people will say is like, oh, does it have fuzzy leaves that are soft? Because that would be a way to identify mullein. And that would not be a way. I mean, that would be a way, a part of a way to identify mullein. But you could also identify other plants that aren't mullein like that and confuse them. And maybe one of the most common things that people confuse with mullein is a plant called lamb's ears. Uh, which is a Stachys uh, Byzantina. Um, it's in the mint family. And when they're little, it's got fuzzy leaves that are kind of the same color. You know, they will never get as big as melon leaves can get. But sometimes you have a really small melon plant and a really small lamb's ear plant. I could see making that confusion. But if you look at the lamb's ear plant, the, the hairs on that, they're longer. And so like if you had a little teeny brush, you know, like maybe if you have uh, a child that has um, dolls and you wonder why you have little teeny household objects all over, right? But you might have a little teeny brush. If you had a lamb's ear plant, you could brush, you could brush, I'm doing a little swiggly brushing motion, and you can see the hairs on the lamb's ears get curvy because they're longer. And you'll not see that on the mullet, like the, the lamb's ear is like long enough to be hairy and to see a pattern. And the mullein is mostly just like fuzzy, you know? And it, the, the fuzz isn't long enough that you're gonna see like squiggles if you run your fingers squiggly across it, or at least nothing very noticeable. <laughs> I love this botanical description. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, it's part of my other job is I teach like really fine detail botany. <laughs> you know, if some people use a loop, I use a little doll hairbrush, uh, you know, to make botanical <laughs> distinctions. <laughs> But probably the most concerning thing, and this is where like, okay, mullein is fairly easy to identify for most people. 
Um, but a very concerning misidentification that happens is people will see digitalis or foxglove before it is put up a stalk and it can actually form a, you know, a basal rosette with alternating leaves like mullen has. And it's not quite the same degree of fuzzy, um, you know, but I've seen some pictures and I've been around some some foxglove that is just starting and I look at it and I'm like, I can see how someone could could see this basal clump of foxglove, maybe in the, the late winter or early spring um, and think that that's mullein. And the reason that that's incredibly problematic is because foxglove is a very dangerous plant. It is significantly poisonous and not only can one single cup of tea kill someone, but one single cup of tea has killed people. And the most common plants that foxglove is misidentified as is comfrey, although comfrey has smooth edges or leaf margins, and mullein, although mullein is fuzzier and it looks a little bit less like mullein than it does like comfrey, people still do make that mistake. And um, I can think actually in the past two months, I've seen people posting pictures of foxglove who live farther south saying, is this mullein? I want to gather it. And then I have to be like commenting um, with a sense of sort of like, no, 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 no. I have a post where someone says, yes, it is, or no, but it's comfrey, or, you know, uh, because that would be a, a very dangerous mistake to make. Don't just look at something and say like, well, actually, general principle in uh in herbalism or foraging or wildcrafting or gathering stuff that grows outside um is never pick anything to ingest or like rub you know on your body without really being confident what it is Good because although we do not live surrounded by you know like teeming poisonous plants they are there and uh you know, they can be around. And, you know, one of the things I've said with, with foxglove is uh, versus melon or versus comfrey, that unless you are visiting the home of an herbalist or someone who's like into permaculture, in the case of comfrey, um, if it's behind a border, like up against someone's house, mixed in with their other shrubbery and ornamental plants, it's probably not comfrey and it's probably not going to be melon people plant foxglove because it has really beautiful flowers um, as an ornamental plant. Um, and so that's just something you should have your, your, your heads up on. Although mullein, the edges of the leaves will have, you know, some subtle but um, present serrations that are slightly rounded, the, the rounded nubby teeth of foxglove are a lot more distinct. And so um, if you're gathering wild plants from you know, out in the area that you live at, or you're, especially if you're visiting a new place, you maybe don't know. Uh, for example, when I was in Washington state near Bellingham, there was foxglove growing wild all over the place, right? So like completely different than it would be by me. Um, but I could see how someone who like lives where I live could go out to that area and be like, oh, it can't be foxglove, it's growing wild everywhere. It's, they, they are in a different place. Um, a great uh, strategy is that if you're learning to uh, collect plants in the wild, don't only learn how to identify the plants you want to pick, learn about the poisonous or toxic plants that live where you live and learn how to identify those so that you're not only thinking, I'm sure that this is the plant that I want to gather, but also I'm sure it's not one of the poisonous plants that might be in my area, right? So that's pretty important. Um, yeah, so mullen, mullen, mullen. You know, the first place to start thinking of, of you know, mullen is probably thinking about mullen leaves because they're the most commonly used. I happen to have, for the people who are watching this, like, ooh, look, it's a nice tuft of really pretty fuzzy mullen leaves that I have gathered. Um, and they're pretty and fuzzy and soft and everything. Um, and people will often refer to them as kind of velvety. But one of the folk names for mullen is Quaker Rouge. And the reason it's called Quaker Rouge, or so the oft uh, repeated story goes, is that the Quakers, you know, are not supposed to wear makeup. And uh, because 
people who have cultural rules usually find ways to circumvent them. Um, they would, it just seems like a pattern in, in the world, doesn't it? Right? Yeah. Oh, there's rules. Like, oh, man, we could probably think creatively a way to get around that. Um, and a way that you could get kind of like rosy cheeks would be to rub mullen on your cheeks. And why would that make them rosy? It's because those, those fuzzy hairs, um, they feel soft, but if you really rub them into your skin, and if you have more sensitive skin, right, or you are just a more constitutionally sensitive, reactive person, um, they're irritating the skin, and that brings blood flow into the area, and that makes your cheeks, you know, rosy or, or blush looking or rougey. But if you start thinking about that and you think like, oh, those hairs are kind of irritating, and then you think of the other thing that people say about mullen, which is that it is herbal toilet paper or cowboy toilet paper or, you know, whatever toilet paper, and you can use that. Um, there's a lot of people who have um, what I think is commonly referred to in, in medical literature as anuses of steel, right? And they could probably rub anything on their butt if they needed to after they pooped and it wouldn't irritate them. But there are other people that I have met who've told me their stories, who were like out backpacking or something. And then they're like, oh, look, it's nature's toilet paper. It's a big mullen leaf and it seems kind of soft and everything. And then they use it and you know, and if you, uh, maybe you use the underside, you know, the, the underside leaves give it some some texture in addition to the, the seeming softness. And then it does a good job, but then you start hiking. And then all of a sudden, um, again, there's a visual here for you, you know, if you're just right. listening, you can, Hold on. No, I'm not gonna do <laughs> This is why I said you can't do anything on the show. Like I knew I needed boundaries. <laughs> okay, well, I'm not gonna do that. Um, but imagine, imagine these are your cheeks, and imagine like right in between them, it's all irritated and inflamed. And then as you're um, continuing to backpack, as this person was, that is the sound of skin rubbing on skin as you walk and that could be a, a bummer and it for this person it was a bummer so my suggestion is if you refer to mullen as like nature's toilet paper or whatever kind of toilet paper you've uh, read that it's called um at least throw in the caveat that before you do that maybe try rubbing it like on the inside of your elbow or some other part of your skin that's a little bit more sensitive um, so you can see how you react to it before the way you react to it is in your crotch. Um, most people that I've talked to, they don't, you know, like any kind of skin inflammation is not their favorite, but crotch inflammation is probably higher on the list of things they would like to avoid. I, yeah, I think I could agree with that. I would add in here, Jim, that there could be other like toilet paper uses. Like there's one thing to be like, really cleaning out your anus but there's another one of just like sometimes um people with female anatomy just need a little pat and dry uh, after peeing and that works quite well with mullen because it's not I like know. a irritating I... like rubbing it in situation so i just want to mention that that it could work in that situation um I but, have so there could be told... varying degrees of how i have been this. told by people who have done that that they've had adverse reactions to it Oh, so okay. I cannot say, you know, um, and it's one of the things like, I, I don't know, because I don't really keep track. I don't have like a little clicker. Um, I'm just not um, <laughs> organized enough. Levels of sensitivity. I will say I've done that a 100 times without a problem. So I mm -hmm. feel very confident in my personal use in that situation. But it's good to know others are more sensitive because yeah you don't want to be the person that recommends something that leads down this road of <laughs> right, right, right. discomfort. <laughs> People will remember where they heard about it from. Right. <laughs> so it's just something to be mindful about. Again, you know, uh, assess your level of, of sensitivity, you know, before trying that out. Um, so a lot of people, probably the majority of people, aren't going to have a bad reaction to it, but some people will. And that some person could be you, or it could be like your your partner, or your your aunt, or your mom. And then that kind of, you know, adds a complexity to the relationship. I'm really curious where this conversation is going to go. So far, we've covered kind of this idea around like what is, 
you know, does a beginner herb exist? Then we talked about botanical ID and now we are talking about this other, yeah, where, yeah. It, this is going to be we're great. Talking about we're just getting started, leaves. Jim. We're, we're just, just getting, getting started. started. <laughs> so we're talking about mullein leaves. And, you know, sort of the, the thing that most people come to is they're like, oh, mullein leaves are good for coughing. So if you're coughing, you know, mullein leaves are good for coughing. And if you are new to herbalism, if you're a beginning herbalist, this is the way that you generally learn about herbs. Um, you either come from two directions. One direction is I have a problem. And what are the names of plants that are good for that problem that can, I can try because I have that problem. And the other is, oh, I learned a plant. What are the problems that this plant is good for, right? And um, with mullein, you know, the, the plant is mullein. And one of the things that's good for mullein leaf and one of the things that's good for is coughs or the problem is coughs. And one of the really good things is, is mullein leaf. Um, you and I, Rosalie, because we have um, spent a lot of time nerding on an herbalism or, you know, we want to be like, ooh, but there's things called specific indications, you know, and there's qualities of plants and like what is good for um one type of cough might not be good or might even be aggravating for another kind of cough. Um, you know, when I think about coughs, the three biggest distinctions I make are, is, is the, um, are the respiratory tissues or is the mucus drier or is it damper and a little bit more wet or is the cough spasmodic, you know, when you're getting into spasmodic coughing. And I would say, if I wanted to say that mullein has specific indications, it seems to be because it's mildly demulcent. It's not going to be super slimy and moistening, but it's mildly demulcent. It's a little bit better for drier coughs and it's also a great relaxant, you know. So if I had to think of the kind of cough um, that just hollers mullein out at me, it would be a cough that sounds like <coughs> So it's got that sort of dry wheeziness to it. The sound in it. If I hear that, I always think like mullen. Um, and then it's like, you don't like cough once or twice. You kind of like cough and then you cough. And those, those spasms of the coughing, the <laughs> they could be actually pretty hard and leave your like lungs and your chest hurting from how hard the, the coughing feels. Um, and that would be very specific for mullen, but because mullen is a pretty gentle herb and because it's only mildly moistening, um, it's probably unlikely to aggravate other types of coughs, you know? So if I were to think about like a very moistening herb, um, like maybe a marshmallow cold infusion that's really super goopy, um, I'd be like, yeah, great for, for drier coughs. If someone had a really damp cough, that is not what I would use, right? They don't need goop, you know? If their lungs already feel wet and goopy on the inside, they don't need goop to make them more moist. Like that's not what's needed. And because mullein is just like, mildly and gently moistening. Most people, even if they had a damper cough, could still use mullein. It might not be quite as specifically indicated as for a drier cough, but if they mixed it with kind of anything aromatic, you know, so that could be something like angelica or it could be something like ground ivy or thyme or sage um, or New England aster, um, then that aromatic quality would offset any of the moistening nature and just make it fine to use. But specifically by itself, I think about more like drier spasmodic coughs with kind of wheeziness. And uh, especially if you're coughing spasm kind of like leaves your chest hurting after that. I feel very good about that. And I could make a tea with that, or I could make a tincture with that. Um, I could make a, tea and then reduce it or just add other stuff and then add honey or sugar, make a syrup with it. That would be grand. There's all, I could make a, I haven't, but I could make a glycerite, you know, with melon. Um, but going back to those fuzzy hairs, for some people, those fuzzy hairs, if they are, at, you know, sitting at the bottom of the cup of tea, if you're just listening, I'm holding up a cup of tea right now. Um, or they are in a tincture bottle and they're sitting down at the tincture bottle where when you squeeze the bulb, it pulls from the bottom of the tincture bottle and you have a bunch of the leaves there and you then squirt it in the back of your throat. That Those fuzzy hairs could be irritating. And so mullein is one of the small number of herbs that when I make a preparation of it, I will pour it through a paper coffee filter. Um, 
not because most people need it, but because it's really not that hard to do. And if you do that, then no one will be aggravated by it. No one will be bothered by those hairs. And, uh, oh, I was going to say earlier that I spent probably like thousands of walks. And so like, because I've talked about Mullen, you know, on pretty much, you know, a half or a third of the walks that I've done, you know, cause it's always around in the area that I live. I've heard lots of stories of people that have told me like, oh, you know, it, I went backpacking. That's where that story came from. <laughs> or, you know, I made the tea and I, you know, after I drank it, I felt like I was having an allergic reaction because my throat felt all irritated and like it was closing up. And it wasn't that they were having an allergic reaction is that they just had lots of little mullen hairs in the back of their throat, but it freaked them out. Right. And if that doesn't need to happen, um, if we can pour something through a coffee filter, uh, then that's pretty good because then it won't happen to the people. Um, another thing that is commonly said about mullen is, oh, the great thing about mullen or the not great thing, depending on your your proclivities, um, is you can just smoke it. You don't have to make a tea. You don't have to make a tincture. You can just take the leaves and you can smoke them. Um, and this is true. And this is a traditional use. And mullen smoke from the burned herb does act as a pretty awesome respiratory relaxant and antispasmodic. Um, but it does change the energetics, you know, the indications of it, because as soon as you take an herb like mullen, which I would consider in most of its forms is like neutral to slightly cooling and uh, slightly moistening in nature. Well, if you light it on fire and you inhale the burning embers of it, it's hot because you lit it on fire and it's dry because you lit it on fire and you're inhaling it. And if anyone has ever um, maybe used something like kitty litter or wood ash to clean up a spill, you had some kind of like very dry thing and you poured it on something wet, what the, the um, what that smoke will do, you know, what that inhaled ash will do is will absorb moisture from the mucus or from the tissues into itself. And if you have a damper cough, then that makes sense. If you have a really dry cough, that could be aggravating, you know, um, there's two ways to lessen the aggravation. So one is to just use melon smoke for, for damper coughs, uh, because that's what it's more indicated for. And another is rather than rolling up a mullen joint or rather than we are also doing something visual, um, getting your really cool wizard pipe, you know, and, uh, where's my lighter? Oh, here we go. Getting your cool wizard pipe and being like, and taking a big hit of <coughs> mullen. Um, you don't need to take big tokes of mullen. You could find one of these little Pac-Man style tea balls. Maybe that you got early in your, your, your interest in herbalism before you realize it's way too small to hold any useful quantity of herb. Right. Um, and you put some, some mullen inside of it and then you take a lighter and you kind of flame the bottom of it until it starts smoking and then you inhale the wisps of smoke you know if you have a whole dried mullen leaf you could just kind of like light the end of the mullen leaf and shake it and inhale those wisps of smoke and those wisps of smoke can manifest the relaxant effect that it has without there being too much smoke that it's likely to aggravate someone who might have a drier cough or drier mucus or drier respiratory tissues so it's a pretty nice way to get around that. Um, for this, I thought those little tea ball infusers were absolutely useless. This is a new a new tip for me. But you you could use. I mean, I've used broken tea balls where you're holding, you know, one end of the, like the slightly larger but still too small broken tea ball. But then sometimes it gets hot, right? Yeah, I was going to say um, that sounds problematic. <laughs> this is kind of, or you need pliers. Um, this is kind of nice because it keeps the ash in too, and you can kind of like wave it around. Um, to sort of contain it. If you had charcoal rounds and you wanted to, you know, light one of those and then wait for it, what does the cool sparking thing for a little bit, but then you wait the however long it takes to fully get um, burned. You could, you could just 
drop little dried mullein leaves on there. But I don't do that most of the time. Most of the time I use this or I just have a leaf or something. I feel um, like there must be someone out there who's saying, but Jim, isn't smoke inhalation bad? Like how is that supporting our lungs? Ah, yeah. Well, so if you have a lot of damp mucus in your lungs and a part of the reason it's hard to expectorate is because it's just too wet. It doesn't have enough body. It doesn't have enough substance that when you have the reflexive cough, you know, which is a controlled spasm in design to help you expectorate and get stuff out of your lungs, that ash will like give more body to that mucus and allow you to more effectively cough it up. Um, I also think, and this is just my opinion and not like a, a truth, um, that the whole idea that smoking anything is inherently bad is a cultural belief because that's certainly not true of like a lot of different cultures in the planet. And what we have done, we, I'm saying like, I'm like North American white guy raised in a mostly like North American white culture. Um, we've largely looked at the abuse of tobacco as a model for what smoking is and how to think about smoking and then apply that to like everything. And, you know, if you're going to say, but any smoke is irritating to the lungs, I would say like uh, plants that you're drinking of that are aromatic, that are acting as diuretics or acting as diuretics by irritating your kidneys, you know, and your urinary tissues and causing you to release more urine. And so should we avoid those too? Um, and wisps of smoke shouldn't be a problem. There's an amazing herbalist, uh, one of the people that I met a long time ago and, and isn't very active in the... Um, the wider herbal world um, named Joyce Wardwell. She's an herbalist from, from uh, Northern Michigan. And she had once told me that she used, you know, inhaled wisps of mullein smoke is like a great antispasmodic for treating pertussis or whooping cough. Hmm. And I learned that from her. And because she's always been a very reliable source of information, I started making that recommendation to people. And, you know, nothing works all the time, but the general feedback I got from people was either that worked pretty good or wow, that was amazing in terms of like just wisps of smoke. So another thing is like, if we're thinking about whooping cough, it's usually like small kids that get that. And probably when we're getting into talking about smoking herbs, like don't fill up your bowl with mum leaves and stick it into your infant's mouth and like, here, take a hit. That, good that tip. might not be the, the best strategy. That wouldn't be my recommendation. Glad we have this on record. Uh-huh. So, um, mullein, tea, tincture, syrup, glycerin. Have you ever made like a, a vinegar out of mullein? Mm, I can't say that I have. Have you made a glycerin out of mullein? No. Yeah, I haven't. I haven't made those two things yet. But those I'd be curious if something, like just, this is not a truth. This is just my pondering is, you know, not all herbs are great in glycerin, like glycerin just doesn't extract it. I don't know, something about mullein leaf and glycerin, I'd be curious if that was an effective preparation. It seems like that would be a harder one to strain the fuzzy hairs out of, yeah? Hmm. Like if you pour the glycerin into your coffee filter, you would just sit there and... <laughs> yeah, so wait. someone has done that, you know, Post in the comments, let us know yeah. your experience. But yeah, I'd be curious about that one. Wait for it to drip. Um, but I would think about those forms as being like neutral to cooling, not super cooling, you know, not like watermelon or cucumber, but like neutral to cooling um, in temperature and, and relaxant antispasmodic in nature. Um, and if you're smoking it, it's going to be hotter again, fire, drier again fire. So different indications for using it for coughs, but still, I mean, it's a really great herb to use for coughs. It's accessible to a lot of people. Um, it's very safe uh, in the, all of the herbal literature about safety for this plant, you know, it's like side effects, none known, you know, contraindications, none known, drug interactions, none known. Um, I have seen people make reference to mullein leaf. We're still talking about mullein leaf and not mullein in general, but mullein leaf specifically is contraindicated, you know, for pregnancy and lactation. But I think that that comes from, this is me saying this, I know this is the charge topic. I think that comes from 
we don't know to my knowledge there aren't studies of mullein leaf and so what people do when there's not studies is they're like you know because we don't have studies uh, on something that we're probably never going to do studies on um we can't show that it's safe so assume it's dangerous and you know if you do that that will save you from any potential dangers but also like if you were to say like you know if you don't know a person just assume that they're dangerous and avoid them because if you do that you'll always be safe right even though you'll also miss out on a lot of things that might be helpful so personally i have never seen anything that actually calls into question the safety of mullen in pregnancy and lactation and the only safety concern i can think of with mullen is not even really a safety concern but some people are sensitive to the fuzzy hairs and they can be irritating and uh, they can become and get like a minor and transient inflammation from that. But largely mullein leaf is very safe for all kinds of respiratory functions. Um, the leaves were also traditionally used by eclectics and physiomedicalists and other people who didn't write stuff down for me to read later as a lymphatic herb. Um, however, when I think about using mullen as a lymphatic, I'm more inclined to think about mullen flowers. Hmm. I've got a little jar of mullen flower oil here. I don't have any dried flowers around. If you're gathering mullen flowers from the most common species of mullen that I know grows in North America for Bascom thapsus, you either need to keep coming back to the same stand over the course of days to individually pick out the flowers from them or you need a lot of plants if you're going to like go and pick flowers in one day because this is a plant that even though it has a lot of flowers they don't all flower at the same time you know you might have one and it's got like i don't know 10 or 12 flowers you can get out of the big long flower stalk and you could pick them all because when you pull the flowers out you're, you're only pulling the petals out you're not actually removing its ability to produce seed so you can gather them um uh, what I like to do, the big ethical consideration that I have with mullein flowers, is I look inside the flowers and I look to see whether there's that little shiny black beetle that's in them sometimes. Hmm. And if the beetle's in there first, I leave that one because it hmm. seems rude to me to be like, oh, I'm going to like squeeze you and pull you out of the plant and throw you on the ground. I don't do that. But if you have the ability to grow mullein, which is really easy, um, you can grow a species called Greek mullein or Verbascum olympicum. And that one just produces so many flowers. And not only the flowers bigger, but it just flowers and 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 flowers. And, flowers and, flowers. Um, and it's pretty astounding. Any mullein flower has this unique property because they're also a little bit fuzzy. And the fuzz on mullein leaves and mullein flowers like acts to insulate them and even acts to preserve them and so you can find mullein flowers that might have fallen off of the the flowering stalk and landed and got caught in the leaves like days ago and they still look perfect right mm -hmm. and so i always look for those or i'll like look on the ground and provided they're clean and they don't look like wilted or discolored i will gather those too uh, but the greek mullein the verbascum olympicum really just produces tons of flowers and so if maybe you're an herbalist and you really want to be able to like make ear oil and not have it be like so tedious, you could try growing that. It's a biennial, so it'll take a year to be a basil rosette, the second year to produce flowers, but then there'll be a lot of flowers. Um, the flowers are maybe more specifically lymphatic, or at least I find them to be than the leaves. And they also have like this anti-inflammatory and, and pain relieving quality most commonly people infuse them into oils and then if someone has an ear infection they will take the oil often mixed with garlic oil uh, and drop it or swab it inside the ear and i think the garlic is acting as uh, antimicrobial in that situation uh, to be more specifically fighting the infection and the mullein flower helps with like the, the fluid congestion, sort of like the congested lymphatic um, fluids in the ear and with the inflammation and as a, it's like a topical pain reliever, right? Um, so it's helping more with the discomfort. I don't think about garlic as really being specific to help with the pain of an ear infection. That's more what the, the mullen is doing. 
And a lot of people will stop there. Um, but I've also made and really loved mullein flower tincture. Um, and so it's got this color and flavor that's a lot more sort of like a, a deep golden yellow when you make it. Um, it tastes significantly different than the leaves taste. Um, and I will use that internally for like lymphatic glands that are swollen and kind of like painful tender to the touch, you know? So like we've got lymphatic glands all throughout our body, but there's certain places that have more than others. Um, although the people listening can't hear me, you can go watch the video. I'm going to choose to show, uh, pretend that the lymphatic glands under my chin and by my neck are swollen and not other lymphatic glands, which might also be swollen and tender and sore and sensitive. Um, but you could, you could take it internally if, you know, like under your jaw, kind of by your ears, you're getting swollen glands when you're sick. Um, and it feels like tender to the touch and, and more sensitive. Um, but you can also even apply the tincture topically to have a similar effect to what the oil will do. Because sometimes, although oils are great, oils stain your clothing, you know, like you might, you might have something going on and just an oil isn't the right thing to do at that time. Um, and so you can just apply the tincture that will be uh, helpful. I've even used the tincture, um, where I I'll dip a cotton swab in it. Um, and then like rub the inside of the ear when that seems like, like, I don't want oiliness in the ear. Sometimes I've uh, worked with people that have, you know, they've got ear thing going on. That's like mucusy. They're overproducing like a lot of fluid and the oil just adds to that. And they don't like the way it feels. Um, and I've mixed mullein flour with red root tincture, which is astringent uh, and also a pretty wonderful lymphatic and just kind of like swab that in the ear. Um, if you're one of those people that are terrified of, of cotton swabs, you don't need to do that. I feel like, you know, I can handle a cotton swab and feel confident with it. But I've met people, they're like, oh, those are dangerous. Hmm. Yeah, not dangerous in my book. Um, yeah, but mullein, it's mullein flowers, lymphatic qualities for swollen, tender, painful lymph glands is, is pretty spectacular. Um, How about as a tea? You mentioned tincture. You know, I've never oil. made mullein flower as a tea because they're they're pretty hard one, uh, you know, dried herbs. And so yeah. even if you're, if, even if you're growing the Greek mullein and you're getting a lot of flowers, like you have a lot and after they fully dry out, they, they shrink a lot. They shrink considerably. Um, maybe a consideration when we're talking about infusing something very moist, like mullein flower in oil is some people will make an infused oil of a very moist, fresh herb, like mullein flower or violet or calendula or dandelion flowers. And then their oil go off because the water content in that oil um, doesn't get separated from the oil when they're finished. And then it goes off because the oil and the water and maybe little residual bits of plant uh, material uh, just make things spoil uh, or cause the oil to go off. So ways you can get around that is you could thoroughly dry your mullein flowers or you could mostly dry your melon flower. So they've got just like a little bit of moisture in them, but not a whole lot. Um, but even then I would say, if you're just doing the thing where you're putting um, melon flowers in a jar of oil and not adding heat to it um, and allowing the moisture to escape, then that's problematic and the oil can go off. What I like to do is put the oil and the flowers in a double boiler and then get it to like just the low steam um, depending on your stove and, you know, what you have access to. Mine has a little warm burner on it. It's the, maybe the only saving grace of having, uh, an electric stove is the warm burner. We'll keep the oil, you know, within a range between like a hundred and 120 something. Um, and then if you leave the, uh, so you have the pot with the water and then a pot with oil and flowers in it, and you leave that uncovered the water in the flowers will evaporate out of the oil. And um, if you leave it there, I tend to do oils on the stove for like days instead of hours, which isn't what most people do. Um, but after uh, 
few days, you can put the lid on it and, you know, maybe overnight or for a few hours and lift it up. If you still see condensation on the inside of the lid, leave the lid off longer. When you can put that lid on and lift it up and there's not really any condensation there, that means that most of the oil, actually most of the water is out of your oil. And then a tip I learned from Henriette uh, Kress in Helsinki, Finland, is after you pour your oil through a strainer and not so much for the hairs but just in general like if you want your oils to last as long as they possibly can if you pour them through a paper filter so there's not little bits of plant material floating in them for stuff to grow on um, and then you let it sit uh in a jar on your counter for like a week any water like teeny little bits of water that's floating around suspended in the oil will settle down to the bottom and then you can carefully decant that off to get like a really clear perfect golden yellow oil um, if though you're only making small quantities of mullein oil and if you're like i think there might still be water in that um you can just put it in a jar in your fridge it'll freeze up to like a semi-solid buttery consistency and then when you want to use it you can just run it under some hot water and then use it and then stick it back in your fridge and you don't have to stress so much about like getting every last drop of water out of your oil. These are really fantastic oil tips that you're giving here. And I know how fantastic they are because I feel like they were hard won. Like I was not taught these tricks day one herbalism, but they were learned over I, time. And um, yeah, they're important. People might not realize how important they are unless you've been like doing it for a while and you're like, oh, that's how you get around that workaround. Oh, that's how the oils don't go rancid. The, the big, uh, oh, pouring your oils into clean jars also helps a lot, right? Um, I think that what it takes to to really get nerdy about like oil preservation is having like a quart mason jar or a quart you know boston round jar of oil go bad on you mm -hmm. and then being like no and that sort of sinking feeling that you have of like ah like, like yeah i can't go back and gather those flowers again because it's you know it's four weeks later or six months later or something and that was a bunch of oil and that was a bunch of flowers and it took me so long to pick all those melon flowers yeah yeah, I really love picking melon flowers. It's one of my favorite things to do. I do too. Very, I really do. Very practically, though, I think about like, oh, nothing really is is wonderfully like meditative and peaceful when I'm spending time with a melon than than picking the flowers one by one. Um, but you might be like, I have to be somewhere, or like, my children are getting hungry. Or, you know, like there's just a time consideration. And, and that's where the, the the Greek mullen can really come into being super helpful for that. Someone once said to me, like, are you sure that the Greek mullen flowers work as well as the uh, the verbascum thapsis? Um, and I think from using them, yeah, I think that there's a lot of companies. So like Herb Farm and I know, I remember the first time I saw that plant was at the United Plant Savers Botanical Sanctuary. And right next to that piece of land was Paul Strauss's uh, Equinox Botanicals. And he, that was what he used to make all of his stuff. And I was like, oh, wow, I've never seen so many flowers on mullen like that. That's amazing. And he was like, oh, that's the Greek mullen. Um, there's also a verbascum densifolium, I think. Densiflorum. Dense is something with an F, L, that if you type it into Google, it'll probably find the right one for you. That's what I feel confident saying right now. <laughs> I feel like verbascum densus and verbascum thapsis and verbascum olympicum all seem broadly interchangeable, um, roots, leaves, and flowers. Um, and verbascum blipteria or moth melon, that plant doesn't really feel quite the same to me. I think that um, it might have some of the lymphatic qualities, but it feels a little bit more figwarty to me uh, as a scrofulary ACE plant. I used a big botany word there. Good job. Yeah. Do you use melon, like other than your stuff, do you use, you have melon flower stuff to tell? Um, I wish that I'd made it more as a tea. I have made it somewhat as a tea because somebody gifted me a bunch of dried mullen. And so I tried it as a tea, but I just, you know, I wasn't, I was just trying it to experience it. And I don't know that I walked away with any like wowses or anything, but it does, it does make a beautiful, you know, that same yellow tea that comes out. So 
Yeah, if you did happen to have a whole bunch, which again, it's hard to do, but if you were like growing lots of Olympicum, I bet it would be a really good bath herb. That was, that's my oh. guess. Just like, oh. like, is this kind of like nourishing lymphatic, you know, getting uh -huh. a bath with it? That'd be my guess. There's a quality that um, is currently something that I'm pondering and speculating about. And I, I love speculative herbalism. I think that speculative herbalism is really important. Um, and the most important thing about speculative herbalism is that you announce that it's speculative, right? <laughs> that it's something that you're thinking and wondering about and playing around with and not something that's true. Because I think that there's people that are like speculating about stuff and it might be true or it might not, but they're sort of presenting it as, oh, this is a thing that it that is. Um, I've noticed some people have told me like, oh, the mullein flower, wow, that's a powerful nervine. And I've been like, really? And after I, maybe the third person told me that, I went and, and took some and I was like, I'm, I'm not really feeling that. And I don't know, um, it takes a certain kind of person because I, what I started doing is like, you know, because sometimes someone tells you that something did something to them and that's an idiosyncratic like personal thing it did to them. But after a few people tell you and then you try it out and it doesn't do the same to you, thing to you, um, I just start wondering about it, right? And so I started wondering like, well, what what is the same about these people? Like, what am I seeing that's the same? And I'm like, oh, it's not like a dry damp thing, right? It doesn't seem like a hot cold thing. Um, it's really a, not like a tense lax thing. And then it's like, oh, you know what? They're all a little bit sort of like dispositionally what we might either refer to as a more choleric temperamented person or a more pitta dosha person or in the much more accessible uh, modern vernacular, like a more type A person that all the people that I can think of who told me that they felt a nerving effect for it, from it had this more like type A, do, go, go, do sort of disposition. So I don't know how we find people like that, you know, to have them try it out and see whether it works. Um, probably be like a big search to find someone with that inclination. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know anyone. either. I, yeah, I don't know anyone. Yeah, I don't know. But it's, it's, I mean, it would be worth looking at. That's what I want um, in order for that to go from like a, a speculation and a like, oh, I think I see this pattern, you know, but it's, it hasn't been a, it's not like it's been a hundred people that I'm noticing yeah. this pattern. It's that like would a, be cool, yeah. like a conference, you know, to get like 20 people who self-identify with having more strongly sanguine traits, choleric, phlegmatic, melancholic, et cetera, and like try different things and see like the reactions for the groups. That, that would oh, be- Oh, that would be super fun. Yeah. I mean, that makes you think. I wonder if there's any herb fairs that we're going to where we might be able to do that. Yeah, that would be great. I mean, and nothing's better than having like herb people like just take stuff and see what happens. Like, that's yeah, sort of that's, like, yeah. It's like the root of all good herbalism. So those are those are probably my my melon flower inclinations, you know, of how my understanding of how to use them. Uh, and and I I rarely see people talk about melon flower for anything other than ear problems. And so I think that the lymphatic thing, so it's painful, sensitive, swollen, congested lymphatics is a, is a great indication for it. And it's a, uh, um, it's just a, it's a, I don't know, it's a cool tincture to have. Like it's, it's something about it, something holding up some melon flower tincture, something about it is just really pretty wonderful and it tastes good. And, um, it makes me happy. I guess part of the reason it makes me happy is when I take it, I think about picking the flowers and like that aspect of it is connected mm -hmm. for me. So maybe that's just like, just, you know, my own personal projection onto it, but it's also my relationship with it. I have that with St. John's wort. Like I just, I cannot separate St. John's wort medicine from the joy of growing and interacting and harvesting St. John's wort. It's all interconnected. Yeah. I, um, I think that that's such an important part of herbalism and I don't want to be like, there's a thing that people do that I, I kind of don't want to perpetuate, which uh, is like this kind of herbalist is cooler or better than another kind of herbalist. You know, um, there are people that I know that are awesome plant people who love plants and love herbs and they do, you know, Ayurvedic medicine or traditional Chinese medicine and they 
they get their herbs in tea capsules or, you know, in formulas that are already made um, or as powders from another country and everything. And they're not really, they don't have a, I know this plant in the ground um, relationship with them. And that's fine. And that's awesome. And that's not the only way to have um, authentic herbalism. But for me, for me, I just like knowing the plants adds so much to how I understand them and how I share them with people. Right. And like, like, I, I just can't imagine. I mean, there are some plants that I use that I don't know as plants in the ground, you know, um, but most of the plants I use are plants that I have like relationships with the plant. And that's just pretty cool. Um, the, the part of mullein that is maybe lesser used uh, and, and lesser known is using mullein root. Um, and if I think about like, ooh, who talks about using mullein root? Um, Michael Moore used to teach, uh, Michael Moore is the herbalist and not the movie guy. If you're out there thinking like Michael Moore, the movie guy, no, um, Michael Moore, the herbalist who I don't hear talked about as much. And if you haven't, if you don't know who Michael Moore is, um, get medicinal plants to the Pacific West and, and just start reading that book. And you'd be like, oh my God, this guy is awesome. Uh, cause he was really insightful and his writing was amazing. Like he had like a concision is concision a word, you know, he didn't have like pages and pages and pages on every single plant, but he, he had like a little. There was character and, for each one. Yeah. They really, he really. He was captured. one of the first people to like, just write the way he speaks too. Like, uh -huh. he, like it was like informal, like he has this just incredible balance between like this informal way of sharing information and then yet sharing this like very advanced or I don't know if mm -hmm. advanced is the right word, but intricate would be a better word, I guess. Intricate yeah. 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 So Michael Moore taught about using mullein for a lot of bladder and urinary issues. And one of the things that I know he specifically said or wrote uh, was that mullein was a strengthening bladder tonic that helped to strengthen the trigone sphincter at the base of the bladder. And I have no idea where that came from, right? Other than, other than Michael, um, I've never seen that indication anywhere. Um, the trigone sphincter part is really precise. Um, and I'm inclined to think that he came up with that idea of is that it's specific to that sphincter. Um, I wonder, and I don't know, and maybe some of his students, um, of, of which there are a lot might know like where he got that, whether he came up with that indication himself, or I know that Michael had learned a lot from, um, people, uh, indigenous people and in, people in Mexico. Um, and that tradition, he's got a book called Los Remedios, um, which is a lot of like Southwestern and Mexican indigenous and cultural herbalism. Um, and that indication may have come from one of those traditions. I don't really know. Um, but it is really pretty good for specifically people that have maybe stress incontinence. Um, and when I think about the other stress incontinence herbs, the two herbs that I use the most, um, because the most important thing for stress incontinence, and that's like, um, you cough or you sneeze or you laugh really hard, or, um, when you're pogo sticking, you, you know, lose a little bit of urine. Um, it's a pogo stick text, right? It's mm -hmm. like, sometimes you have, have clients and I'll be like, they tell me have incontinence and I'm like, it could be stress incontinence. It could be spastic bladder syndrome. It could be overflow incontinence. Um, you know, there's functional incontinence, there's different kinds of incontinence, but like, if I want to test out whether it's stress incontinence, I'll used to be like, can you pogo stick down the hallway and back? Fun. And then if they're like, where's your bathroom? When they're like halfway down the hallway, I'm like stress incontinence. <laughs> um, this is a clinical, you know, assessment technique I've developed over time. Mm -hmm. no, actually, it's probably the most common cause of stress incontinence that I know of is you had a baby um, and you used a lot of energy pushing a baby out of you. And afterwards, like you've got stress incontinence. And um, although the, the, the pogo stick thing is a little bit of a joke, I don't want to wreck it for you there and be like, oh, wait a minute. I was going, I was just looking up pogo sticks on Amazon to buy and write off as a business expense. Um, 
we for a while had a trampoline in our backyard and when the kids were little and their friends would come over sometimes the um the friends would be like mom come on the you know the, the trampoline thing you know like parent come on the trampoline thing and the, the parent would be like no i'm good i'm okay all right you know and i'd be like huh oh, this is not this is not a universal indicator, but it makes me wonder. It makes me be like, this might be a thing, you know? The other things I used, this is where all the, the hopping pogo stick stuff started. The other thing I used for stress incontinence, um, the two herbs I used the most are agrimony, which is astringent, and uh, staghorn, or mostly staghorn, but or smooth sumac um, tops, the, the berry clusters and the upper stems and the leaves mixed together. And those are both, distinctly astringent plants. Um, and that makes sense as something that is a strengthening bladder tonic. And mullein root, when you make a, a tea or an infusion or a decoction out of this, the flavor is intensely earthy. It's minerally, right? It's got a hard flavor, the flavor we associate with lots of minerals. And it does not feel uh, decidedly astringent. You know, there maybe does feel like a drying thing, but it's more from the minerals and not so much from the astringency. It doesn't have the, the distinct tightening effect of that. Um, there may be some variation. There are plants that I know here that don't seem as astringent to me. And then when I go on them in the Southwest, I try them out, they seem a little bit more astringent. So plants can vary based on where they're growing. But I always thought that that was pretty interesting that like um, when I'm formulating with them, um, although I might mix together agrimony and staghorn sumac tops and mullein root. If I only picked two of those, I would always do one of those in mullein root rather than agrimony and staghorn sumac together because I feel like those are two astringents and then an astringent and mullein root. The mullein root's doing something else. I don't know what. Um, what else about bladder stuff? I learned maybe initially from Seven Song uh, about you know, him referring to like, oh, that would be something, this is a maybe, I'm, I'm going on what I can pull out of my memory right here, is like a consideration when you're working with someone with interstitial cystitis. Interstitial cystitis is a condition that's kind of like not irritable bowel syndrome, but irritable bladder syndrome. So it's like an autoimmune inflammatory condition affecting the bladder and there's a lot of things we need to think about it it wouldn't be like oh you have that just take mullein root but mullein root is something that i would consider uh, to be a part of a protocol uh, to address that situation or that condition there is an herbalist in northern california uh, i cannot pull out the specific town that uh, she lives in named krista sinadinos and krista is a spectacular herbalist um and has online a really good pdf specifically um it was something she wrote for paul bergner's medical herbalism journal um and it is on the use of mullen root uh for different kinds of urinary situations uh and there's different recipes uh you know base formulas for addressing prostate issues versus stress incontinence versus you know other different urinary things and uh, things affecting the bladder and it's really probably the most that I've ever seen written down in one place. I think it's a four pages long uh, on mullein root for urinary issues. So that is a spectacular I she, resource. I think she talks about for childhood bedwetting too. For yes. That. Yeah. yeah. So uh, lots of bladder issues. Um, I also learned from, I think initially it probably came from David Winston about mullein root as a nerve pain remedy. Hmm. And just generally as a nerve remedy, maybe the first way I heard about this is I was working with someone quite some time ago uh, who had Lyme disease. And at a certain point, they contacted me and said like, um, oh, I started using the mullein root you told me about for, for Bell's palsy because I got Bell's palsy, which is like a partial facial paralysis um, related to Lyme disease. It can happen for other reasons, but it does happen not uncommonly related to Lyme disease. And he's like, you know, you told me about it and I tried it out. It's amazing. Like it really made a big difference, right? It really, it's like things were getting worse and turned things around and I'm like really happy about it. And I was like, I've never heard of that before. 
<laughs> I, don't, I don't think you heard about that from me because I don't know about that. I, at the time I was using Mullen Root, um, but not for that reason. Hmm. I, I learned later that uh, that's something that David Winston teaches. Um, and so maybe he heard about it from David, but also knew that I used Mellon Root and um, mixed up the two. But uh, unless a part of me that, you know, I'm not consciously aware of came to him in a dream uh, and said, like, you should use Mellon Root for your Bell's palsy because it helps with nerve issues. Um, but having learned about that from, from uh, this person and then finding out that David use it that way. I have used it for a lot of nerve pain that has a spinal involvement, whether it's upper, you know, cervical spinal involvement or thoracic spinal involvement or lower, you know, um, lumbar uh, spinal involvement. Um, I like using mullen root and I might use for sciatica. Uh, a lot of people would think like, oh, for sciatica, St. John's Ward is really helpful. And it's been my experience that if you mix St. John's Ward with mullen root and use the two of them mm -hmm. together, they work together better than either one does individually. So that's become like a favorite pair of mine, although I will often add maybe another herb. Right. And the other herb, it could be Jamaican dogwood. It could be sometimes black cohosh. It could be uh, white or yellow sweet clover or mellow lotus species um, to address how that nerve pain is presenting. But the two of those together are pretty, pretty helpful. And I've used it for um, facial neuralgia and trigeminal neuralgia also with St. John's wort. And then again, maybe Jamaican dogwood. Um, to to address that and found that it's it seems pretty helpful i haven't noticed so much that when i don't see some spinal connection that just for like nerve hypersensitivity mullen root seems to be like the thing to go to you know so i, I could add it in but my my personal indication that i use for it is is there some kind of spinal involvement is there a subluxation is there a pinched nerve um is there something that tells me that where the like a, a root uh cause in this uh, presentation is some kind of spinal mission alignment and nerves are being pinched or impinged or whatever um you know in those cases i think it's important to realize like what what is reasonable to think a plant can do versus what is not um, sometimes plants do stuff that isn't reasonable at all, right? which is really cool and everything. But other times, like we might think like, oh, you know, we can think about mullen root and St. John's work for a pinched nerve. But um, if if I was walking by, let's just say the nerve is your foot, right? If I was walking by and as I walked by, I stepped on your foot and it hurt. And then I walked away and you're like, oh, my foot hurts because Jim stepped on it. Um, you could take something that would help with that pain. But if I walk by and I stepped on your foot and I stopped and I started talking with you and I was still standing on your foot, you could still take something to help with that pain, but you need to get me to be off of your foot. And so in a lot of cases where I see someone with spinal based nerve pain, I'm not just going to suggest herbs to them. I'm going to be like, oh, you also need to see someone that does some kind of body work because it's not like you have a pinched nerve, pinched past tense. It is currently in the process a pinch present tense and you need to like get the two maybe vertebrae from squeezing on that nerve and that is probably going to take some kind of physical manipulation or stretching or body work or some kind of like physical modality in addition to using just herbs um but the the area with mullen root that really like sucked me in and and led me to a deeper level of of mullen love was one day I woke up um, and this is probably like at least 20 years ago, maybe longer. I woke up and I was just like, you know, for people that cannot see right now, because you're just listening, you can watch the video, but also just imagine me kinked over to one side, right? And I woke up and I just like, I, I couldn't quite straighten up. Like my, my lower back was kinked, you know, uh, down in my, my lumbar spine. And I could, I could like course correct my shoulders to make myself look kind of straight, but I had a little squiggle. Uh, and it's not like I had acute onset scoliosis. It was just like out of place. And I was like, oh, this is irritating. And it wasn't terribly painful. I wasn't in, in agony, um, but I, you know, I tried stretching and I did the, 
cow cat thing and you know i went into my my basement because i have a basement and i grabbed onto the rafters and I, I hung myself from the rafters you know holding on to it to let the weight of my body stretch and um you know i i tried different things and i just could not get like my back to sort of like slip back into place and while i was doing this and uh i just sort of like in my head in the not quite verbal way that we sometimes get impressions in our head and we we will say like oh the plant is talking to me i was just hearing like and so uh after a while because nothing else was working i was like okay fine and you might wonder why I, as an herbalist, was saying like, okay, fine, rather than just being like, oh, I'm going to go and get some mullein root. And it was because at the time, um, there wasn't any growing in my yard, and it was also winter, and there was snow on the ground. Um, but mullein root, the, the leaves, because they're fuzzy, insulate, and I knew where some grew. And so I hobbled out to my car, and I sat in my car, all kinked to one side, and I drove, and I you know, went out with a shovel, and I uh, stomped it into the, the mostly frozen ground where I could see a cluster because there wasn't a ton of snow. There was enough snow. I could still see where the, the mullein rosettes were overwintering. And I, I chiseled out two mullein roots and I um, brought them back and I got them inside and I was able to rinse the, the dirt off of them. Uh, and I chopped them up and I poured hot water over them and I let them steep just long enough to where they weren't going to burn my mouth when I, when I drank them. And when I took a sip of them, I just slip right back into place and i was like mm -hmm. wow that was cool that one experience was not enough to go on and be like mullen just does this but uh i started recommending it to other people like i you know i don't know if this is going to work but i would try it out uh and after it worked for a couple other people i made some tincture of it so like i should i should have this around i've only used the the tea i didn't wasn't even decocting it i only used the tea um and i made some tincture and i started having people try the tincture and then i had a pretty significant back injury where i was like changing my tire and the, the car fell off the jack and it yanked me down and it hurt a lot um, and then i was in a significant amount of pain and mullein root was not the only thing that i used but it was a big part of what i used and so at the time i was picking at the impression that i got was like that the mullein um it's a biennial. So the first year, there's just the basil rosette. The second year, it puts up a stalk, goes to flower, goes to seed, and then dies. It's done with its life cycle. Because of this, I want to um, think about gathering the root in the fall of the first year through the spring of the second year. And when it starts to put up the stalk, once the stalk gets to a certain point, the reason the stalk's getting to a certain point is it's using up the stored food that was in the root. So I like to gather between the fall of the first and the spring of the second year. And um, I made that tincture and I thought like the plant's storing up all of that energy into that root to put up that straight stalk. And one of the cool things about melon stalks is like, if you find a plant and provided it's not growing in really loose soils, you can like grab onto the stalk and like bend it over uh, pretty far. And if you let go, it just goes, Bing! it doesn't actually make that noise, but imagine the noise in your head when it goes and it straightens right back up. Um, but even if you do that and maybe the stem kinks and then it's bent over to the side, you will then see the growing part of the stalk start to grow straight up, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's really pretty cool. It, it, it wants to be upright. It wants to be vertical. Uh, and so I've just decided uh, that my impression is that that is a quality that is sort of stored in that root. And I use it for spinal misalignments. Um, I will use it often with Solomon seal. Um, if there's nerve involvement with St. John's wort or maybe sweet clover, um, if there's a, a weakness of the, the connective tissues and fascia and cartilage, I'll usually throw in some horsetail in there, or maybe some, some royal fern, uh, into that Osmunda regalis. And, uh, I think it's pretty amazing. I mean, this many years into it, you know, decades into it, I feel very confident that mullein root has a specific affinity to sort of spinal misalignments um, and can be very, very helpful in them. It's probably one of the things that I get the most email about, you know, hmm. so like my website's had an article on mullein for a long time. 
there's an explanation of you know my thoughts on mullen root for spinal misalignments and when i think about like ooh, what do people email me the most about there's lots of mullen stories and they're not all like i was in terrible pain and then i took mullen and i'm all better they're often like I've been working on this. Maybe I've been getting physical therapy or some kind of body work done, or maybe I was taking some other kind of formula, you know, or using following some other kind of protocol. And when I added the mullen root in, like everything like got drastically more effective. Like there was a, mm -hmm. a rapid improvement in that. So that's been uh, something that I just, I really love. And I love, love the taste of mullen root too, because it's got this earthy mineral, very, very full flavor. And there's this weird thing um, that happens when you tincture it. And I've seen this in teasel too. I, I, I do not know what causes this, but I chop up some mullen roots um, and I put them in my mason jar and I pour my, my ethanol on top of them. And as they're extracting, the, the tincture ends up being very, very dark. I'm holding up a very dark jar of, of mullen root, uh, very, very dark brown, earthy color, kind of a coffee color. Um, but when I look at the herb that's being extracted, sometimes the herb looks kind of like brown and other times it's like a bluer shade of turquoise mixed in there. And other times it's a greener shade of turquoise mixed in there. And there's just like a fluctuation as it's extracting. I've had people who have made the tincture being like, I think there's something like, like something bad is happening because it looks green inside. I'm like, no, that's just, that's not mold growing. It's just something that happens when you're extracting the root. Uh, so yeah, mullen root, awesomeness. Um, Matthew Wood uses mullen leaves similarly for spinal misalignments. Um, and I have used mullen leaves similarly, but I really feel like the root seems more specific to this. You know, I'm not going to say it's better, but for me and my relationship to it, it's, it's my go-to for, for spinal issues. People have told me that when mullen is bruised and it blackens that whatever causes that blackening that constituent that compound um increases mullen's ability to act as a pain reliever and i have heard about some people that when they're harvesting mullen and they're wanting to use it for for pain relief um you know they will they will bang it around a little bit to bruise it beforehand I've not done that. Like, I don't know. Like, I never look at Mullen and be like, I want to bang you up a bunch. Like, it just hasn't struck me to do that. But I do know, I do know people um, that use it for that. And then um, you will commonly see references, and I have not done this, of Mullen seeds uh, being used as sort of like a fish poison. Um, I have no experience with that. Uh, I, what, what I do with Mullen seeds is I uh, shake some out of the stalks in the fall. And then I spread them to places I want mullen to grow. And if you're doing this, a consideration. Uh, mullen, at least verbascum thapsus and verbascum olympicum, are not native plants. Um, and so be mindful about how you're cultivating them. You know, this is not like take them out to your state park and introduce them into national forests and everything like that. They may already be growing there. Um, I think that there is. Uh, a seemingly infinite seed bank of mullen already in soil everywhere that mullen could possibly grow. Because I used to make a joke that if you wanted to grow mullen, one of the best ways to cultivate it, because the seeds are light dependent germinators. So that means if I have a field full of goldenrod and I throw mullen seeds into the field full of goldenrod, they're not gonna germinate because the goldenrod is creating a ton of shade and they don't have enough light to germinate. But if that field gets plowed up or mowed down, and those seeds are exposed to light, all of a sudden a bunch of mullen grows there. Um, when there's been soil disruption, mullen seeds, you know, that's perfect for planting mullen seeds. Um, if there's a burn, like if you burn a brush pile and then throw mullen seeds down on that, it loves burnt soil. It, yeah. love, it loves colonizing burns. And so at first my, my saying is like, oh, if you want to cultivate mullen burn a brush pile and then shake some mullen seeds out there and then i realized that in a lot of parts of the country all you need to do is burn the brush pile and there's already mullen seeds in the soil that is waiting and then they just start growing that doesn't always happen but if mullen is common in your area that's not unlikely uh what else i think maybe 
a little bit more esoterically or less physiologically. If I think about mullen and its straight little stalk, um, it, it can be used sort of like as a, how do I want to say this, as a magical herb. You can define magical as placebo if you want to, if that makes you feel better. <laughs> or as something that comes out of the, the back end of a bull. Um, but um, it's something for, for people that are like, they're having a hard time staying on their path. They're trying to go on a path and they keep diverging in this direction or on that direction, right? They can't keep a, a directionality to them. And uh, in those cases, how would I use melon? You could take like a drop or two or three of the tincture and just be doing it in drop doses the way people would use flower essences. Um, you could um, rub some of the tincture on your um, wrist or your, your third eye or your temples or your heart. You could probably put it on your earlobe. I don't know that it matters exactly where you put it, right? I think the act, right? The act of, and, and why people could think this is placebo, or if they're inclined to, it's just a way to do something magically is like, when you take a tincture, when you apply a tincture, when you hold on to a part of the plant, like I'm just gonna reach into my little jar and grab some mullein, right? Just like hold on to it and think about it. Hold it to my heart. I could hold it to my earlobe again. It allows you to check in with yourself and be like, what am I trying to do? What is my intention? Um, you know, it might be that every time you have your melon tincture and you take your melon tincture, uh, a few drops of it, you stop and take a breath and you think, why am I using this? And then you take a few drops of it. Um, that's important, you know, whether that is the plant doing something, you know, if you're more scientific or materialistic or you just don't believe in that that's fine if you think it's all like psychological affirmations that's also fine but it's something that you're using the plant as a catalyst to facilitate an intention and that's still using the plant and that's always something that's been done with plants and we don't want to not think that that just doesn't happen because it's not tangible and there's not a, an alkaloid or you know a glycoside that we can attribute to it um you know whenever we take a plant um, whether we're taking it for some kind of intention about how we want to live our lives or we're taking it because our back is hurting or we're taking it because like we wish we could get back into that cross-country pogo stick thing but it would just be too embarrassing um or we're taking it because we have a respiratory condition you know maybe i hear people talk about like oh you know mullen is good for copd chronic obstructive pulmonary disease um and it can be helpful for that as a part, as with interstitial cystitis, because that's a more complicated condition as a part of a larger protocol. Um, when we take it, when we're making tea, when we're taking our tincture or our syrup or our whatever form of mullen that we're using, when we're lighting our little, you know, tea strainer on fire and we're thinking about doing it, just think about what you want something to be doing. Because the more times you're connecting with that intention, the more receptive, like, that your body is going to be. And it doesn't matter whether it's placebo or not, it just helps you know, and it feels good to do that. And I encourage doing that with all the plants you use, but because I'm talking about mullen, mullen especially right now, I'm trying to think of what I didn't say. I didn't say that you could um, dip your mullen flower stalks in, in wax or tallow and make a candle. If this was attached to the stock too, it'd be a, a great torch. Mullen does have a history of being used for torches, um, but you have to put some kind of burnable fat on it. It's not like the movies where there's like a stick and someone like puts a stick in the fire and all of a sudden it's a torch that lasts for a long time. That really doesn't need <laughs> some kind of oil or fat. Um, I've met someone who made uh, the the drill part of a bow drill fire starter with mullein stalks. And then he used mullein leaf as tinder for fire starting, right? And that kind of like ties together this connection of mullein and fire together. Um, we talked about, you know, using mullen as a smoke, um, for treating respiratory issues, but some people might want to like, they, they might just like smoking herbs. They might just like smoking, right? So there's a couple different strategies. I could make a case for why smoking could be, um, not horrible. One of them is like, let's say a person is habitually smoking 
tobacco. That's not healthy, right? That's bad. It's just undeniably cancer instigating. Um, and if you were to maybe stop smoking pre-rolled cigarettes and either roll your own cigarettes or get a pipe and you started mixing a little bit of melon into your tobacco and then a little bit more melon and a little bit less tobacco and a little bit more melon and a little bit less tobacco and a little bit more melon and a lot less tobacco, you're smoking less tobacco. And that's, that's a pretty good thing. Like even if you don't stop smoking, you're smoking less tobacco. Um, mm -hmm. For some people, maybe they could, you know, sort of leave the tobacco out and mix other herbs into their mullen um, so that they've got a mix of herbs that that feels good. And the mullen really doesn't have a lot of flavor. And if it's really, really dry, it can be kind of harsh. Uh, but if it's a little bit moist and you add uh, some aromatic herbs and also importantly, some astringent herbs in there to add sort of like body to the flavor of the smoke, it could be a nice smoke that you can use to stop smoking things that are absolutely and undeniably harmful um or if it's just an occasional thing you know um and you have a eccentric wizard pipe and every now and again you like to go out and puff on your herbal smoke blend uh a little bit of mullen in the mix can be kind of nice it helps things uh of different densities and textures burn more evenly that's uh, one of the the big reasons that mullen was used in smoking mixtures what did i forget rosalie well, the things that you forgot, you just mentioned. Xavier uses the mullen stock for fire friction or friction fire. So I was going to mention that. We do a lot of the torches too um, uh -huh. for celebrations. Yeah. I don't know. It, when I think that you've forgotten something, you you went back and covered it. Like the biennial plant. That was something I was going to mention. Yeah. It feels pretty complete, Jim. The, the big for question. Now. For now. I was going to say, the big question is, what don't I know yet? Like, there's stuff right. that I don't know yet. You know, in another, um, this is funny because this is another thing where someone told me that they learned something from me. And I was like, I've never heard that before ever. Um, I was at an International Herb Symposium conference and uh, I went to one of Matthew Wood's classes and he was talking and he was talking about Mullen. And he said, Oh, I learned from jim mcdonald you know um that when you're gathering mullen you want to gather like the nice leaves uh on the mullen but you never gather the outer leaves uh on the you know the, the the perimeter of the basil rosette and in my head i was sort of like jumping ahead because uh because they're rotting and they have tons of dirt on them you know like all the reasons i wouldn't gather them but he said because they'll give you nightmares and i was like yeah, I've never heard that before. <laughs> so I was like, uh, you raised my hand. I was like, oh, you know, I, I'm, I'm not sure that that came from me. And he's like, oh, no, I very distinctly remember you, you know, telling mm. you about that. Seems to be a recurring thing that happens. Matt and I, there's things I've said to him. I think that I initially, when I started using mullen root, said like, oh, I, you know, I did the mullen root thing. I thought maybe I had like learned it from him. And he's like, no, I don't really use that. Uh, I think even now he he doesn't use melon root a whole lot. I think he still mostly uses the leaves. Uh, so we've had several different things uh, where I think one one time we were we were at a place together and we did a very impromptu herb walk and he was like, "He's Jim. I'm Matt. We're the Mullen Brothers." <laughs> so I was like, "Yeah, all right, I go with that." I feel like I um, if, we will we will get matching shirts once and. I feel like there's a video of that somewhere. I have to find it. I don't know what that's at. Um, yeah, I'm just, I mean, I'm really, I'm just fascinated to find out like what I'm going to learn next, you know, about this beginner's mm. herb that I have not right. moved on from, but moved into, you know. Well, Jim, for people who are listening and they're like, wow, that was a fantastic download of information about Mullen, blew my mind. I wish I could study with Jim more. Do you have possibilities for that situation? I do, but I remembered one more thing. Okay, let's do it. So a lot of people um, don't often um, think about mullen when they're they're learning English or learning to spell or learning grammar because they they've forgotten the old adage of I before E except in mullen. Because <laughs> it's 
M-U-L-L-E-I-N. So I before yeah. E, except in Mullen. And sometimes people say, they call it something else. What else do people call Mullen? Mullen? I've heard Mullen, Mullen, yeah. It's acceptable. I've heard Mullen, yeah. Mullen. Um, oh, other stuff I do. Uh, well, if you live in Michigan, um, I teach a lot in Southern Michigan, but also in different parts. If you're looking right now, um, ooh, uh, I I live kind of here, so in Southeast Michigan, so I teach here. But I also teach in Lansing, which is kind of like Lower Central Michigan, and in Grand Rapids, and sometimes in Kalamazoo, which is Lower Southwestern Michigan. And sometimes I teach up in Traverse City, which is up where your your pinky fingernail would be, um, if you're holding your hand the right way. Um, and I might be doing something kind of somewhere a little bit north west of Flint, that's in the works. Um, so if you live in Michigan, um, I teach in Michigan regularly because I live here. And I also go to different places and teach. And sometimes I'm at conferences teaching. So you can come and see me and I would love that. But if you are, if you are not somewhere you can come and see me, if you are, are like in Tanzania, or maybe you are in Liechtenstein, or Madagascar, or you're, you live on the Faroe Islands, I also have stuff that's online. And, uh, you know, right now I'm taking enrollments, not right now when you're watching this, but right now when I'm talking, uh, which is late January, almost February, uh, 2024, I'm taking enrollments for both the online version and the in-person version of my Lindera course, which runs kind of from April into October. And that's where we, we talk about herbs and um, the, the energetic way that I think about using herbs, sort of like the framework by which we take all of the pieces of information that we know about herbs and we put them into a usable structure that helps us figure out what to do when someone asks us a question about how we can help them. Uh, and so in person and online, that is an option. The websites are herbcraft.org or herbcraft.podia.com. Uh, the Podia one is for the online stuff. The herbcraft.org is more for the in-person stuff. I can also be found posting on different social media things, sometimes amusing little videos that my wife puts together, hmm. sometimes long rambly posts that I put together. Sometimes I share some of my favorite prog rock, which is just an added bonus in your life. Like Tori Amos. Totally Prague. Yeah. Tori is undoubtedly Prague. Undoubtedly. And the best. So Jim, um, we have a last question for you, which is <gasps> how do herbs instill hope in you? Oh, herbs are hope, aren't they? Yeah. Because like, herbs, like, let's see, nature is hope. And even though we are nature, and even though we cannot as humans be disconnected from nature because where would we go to? Um, a lot of people feel disconnected, right? So we've got like a, a mental block or a mental sense of disconnection um, that doesn't really exist, but it's in our mind anyway. Um, but when we look at forests and mountains and rivers and meadows and the plants that grow in them, because there's like lots of plants, like, you know, kind of most places that I go to, there's lots of plants. Um, and I look at it, I'm just like, that is, that is like my bomb. When, when, when my life is really hard, when my life is like a struggle and things are tough. And even though I'm sort of naturally inclined to be pretty optimistic when I'm just like, oh, and I can go out and, and be in a place where the plants are just growing the way that they just naturally grow. I feel very inspired. I feel a sense of awe and a sense of wonder um, that to me is like the fuel I need to keep going to like let go of that, like, I don't know how I can make this keep working um, to just like plants are always doing that. They're always making everything keep working. You know, there was a time I once I was stuck in traffic on an expressway. It was really horrible. We weren't moving at all. And it was where like an expressway met another expressway. It was all concrete and it just wasn't moving. It was really hot. And I looked out of my, my, my window, which I felt like I, I needed to have down for some fresh air, but I was also like, Ugh, all this exhaust that I looked in, in, in the expressway, there was a dandelion growing and it was not only growing, it was flowering. 
right? Mm -hmm. And I'll never forget that moment. And it's of course like the, the dandelion, you know, is such a great example of this. But um, I, like, it's not only growing; it's flowering. And so, mm -hmm. plants they they live with everything that they are, and plants don't say like, well my growing conditions are not very conducive to my ability to thrive. So I'm not going to flower. I'm not going to like be what I am. They're like, I'm here. I'm going to be what I am with everything that I have. And, and they do that. And to me, that is like really the, the greatest inspiration that, you know, that I can think of. Hmm. Thank you, Jim. I guess if, if, if I was an entomologist, I might find inspiration in in the the veracity, uh, the survival instincts of ticks, but I'm like I'm into plants, so I'm going with plants for this. I feel like if I if I did that whole story and it was about ticks, it wouldn't be people would not be as receptive to it. There'd be a little bit of no. skeevy. We yeah. all love our dandelions, lands, yeah. right? Well, thanks for that reminder of hope, Jim. And thank you so much for s spending this incredible amount of time sharing about this beginner plant, Mullen. And um, yeah, I look forward to like the next version when it's like Mullen 2 and we get to hear all the I know, it'll be new all the ways. Stuff. But yeah. That'll be like the, we could just do like, how long can we go on? Like the next, okay, sure so the next love one. that. The next one, the, the fourth, the fourth gym on, on herbs for Rosalie podcast is going to be how long before Rosalie's like, no, you have to stop. Like we'll see which one of us can hold out longer. We should do a webinar with that. And then we could just see at what point people drift away. Well, we could have it where like people, you know, cause a lot of times ah, pulled my headphones out again. Um, a lot of times like people will want to come to a class and like, Oh, the class starts at three and I don't get out of work until six or, you know, whatever. And like, what if we have something and it's like, well, this is the start time, but you can just jump in whenever, because we're going to keep going until we can't banter anymore. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if I know how long that will take. I definitely think that I would give up before you, Tim. I'm just saying it now. I don't but know. It, but you could probably like, I mean, there's probably like a, a couch or something there, or does your chair recline? You can have a blanket. You can. I'll really just keep comfy. going. Bring, yeah, I'll just keep popcorn going. and cider. <laughs> uh huh. All right, we should maybe take a poll. See if that's what people really want. <laughs> In the meantime. Oh, we're gonna take a poll. I feel really yeah. confident now because I feel yeah. like there's a lot of people that are gonna be yes to this idea. So. Okay. Okay. We'll see. see. What we got out of this is. <laughs> It, um, we're going to do a never ending podcast for our next episode. And also, I think in the beginning of the show, you said that I was in charge of the show. I can do whatever I want. So it's done. <laughs> it's all recorded. All right. I know. I was going to say, I wish there was no proof of this, but there is. All right, Jim. Well, I'm going to call it now. That's what I'm doing right now. So we're calling it for today. Well, thank you. It's always wonderful. Um, to chat herbs with you and also just to spend time with you because you're awesome oh thanks jim it's been a pleasure as always thanks oh you're you're awesome too as always thanks for being here don't forget to head over to the show notes at herbswithrosaliepodcast.com where you can get a transcript of the show and also any links you might want to click into such as to jim's offerings which are found at herbcraft.org and herbcraft.podia.com if you'd like more herbal episodes to come your way, then one of the best ways to support this podcast is by subscribing on YouTube or your favorite podcast app. I deeply believe that this world needs more herbalists and plant-centered folks, and I'm so glad that you're here as part of this herbal community. Also, a big round of thanks to the people all over the world who make this podcast happen week to week. Nicole Paul is the project manager who oversees the whole operation from guest outreach to writing show notes to actually uploading each episode and so many other things I don't even know. She really holds this whole thing together. Francesca is our fabulous video and audio editor. She not only makes listening more pleasant, she also adds beauty to the YouTube videos with plant images and video overlays. 
Tatiana Rusikova is the botanical illustrator who creates gorgeous plant and recipe illustrations for us. I love them. I know that you do too. Christy edits the recipe cards and then Jenny creates them as well as the thumbnail images for YouTube. Michelle is the tech wizard behind the scenes and Karen is our student services coordinator and customer support. For those of you who like to read along, Jennifer is who creates the transcripts each week. Xavier, my handsome French husband, is the cameraman and website IT guy. It takes an herbal village to make it all happen, including you. One of the best ways to retain and fully understand something you've just learned is to share it in your own words. So with that in mind, I invite you to share your takeaways with me and the entire Herbs with Rosalie community. You can leave comments on my YouTube channel, on the herbswithrosaliepodcast.com show notes page, or simply hit reply to my Wednesday emails. I read every comment that comes in, and I'm excited to hear your herbal thoughts and ahas about Mullen. Okay, you have lasted to the very end of the show, which for this episode is saying a lot. <laughs> that means you get a gold star and this herbal tidbit. Well, Jim certainly covered a lot about Mullen in this episode, so I had my work cut out for me to find these herbal tidbits. But I did find two more benefits of this tenacious and generous plant. The first is its ability to heal wounds. A 2021 randomized control trial involving women with episiotomy wounds found that those using a cream with Mullen showed better healing than those using a placebo. And something to keep in mind when harvesting all plants but especially mullen, is to know that the soils you're harvesting from aren't contaminated with heavy metals. Mullen is well known for its ability to pull heavy metals from the soil, which is awesome for soil remediation in polluted areas, but it isn't great for your cup of tea. If you'd like even more mullen in your life, check out my solo episode all about mullen. Cheers. <laughs>